with the great legendary Tommy Jitterbug. Your name is known from north, east, south, west, you know, out of, you know, out of London. You're all over the place. Um, you were born in 1949. I mean, that always surprised me because I never realised that you were, you were that old. But you have a, a, a real deep history on, on the streets. I mean, you, 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 tell us a bit about your story, where you, where you grew up, where, you, where are your parents from, where were they from? You know, you talk about an history on the streets. You know, my father was from um, West Africa, Lagos, a Nigerian. And he came to London in um, 1928, 29, I think. And he met my mum, who was from Chelsea, Fulham Broadway, a white woman. And they got together at a time of racialism. They weren't, they weren't allowed to be together. You know, um, there was a, a time in London where racialism was, was really up there. And um, they raised nine of us, five girls and four boys. And, um, you know, I was really, you know, grateful to my mum and dad for how they tried to raise me. But I came against the discipline and the respect that my father bring to his own. I disregarded that in the way I chose to grow in the life that I had because of certain incidents that took place around my mum and dad. I saw men calling my mum a nigger lover because she married a black man, spitting on her. My father had to go to work with a weapon and he were not a violent man but just to get to work and to get home to provide for his family. So, you know, it wasn't a good time growing up in the early 50s and 60s. You went, you went to Borstal when you were about, what, your first sentence was like when you were about 14, 15? 1964. I was given six months to two years for cutting a man's throat. I robbed him in a place called Cable Street. It was like the West End in the 60s. It was gambling houses, you know, nightclubs, pubs, prostitutes, seamen would come to that place to get a drink, to gamble their money away and to meet a prostitute. And then when you came out of jail you ended up in the West End? I um, came out of jail, you know, my, my, my lifestyle had totally gone in a different direction from when I got the six months to two years. I met other criminals in Bullstall, a higher ranking than who I was, but I got established in prison by having fights, defending myself, you know, you either, you either was a goer or you was a gitter. And you know, I made sure I was a gitter and people went for me. And um, when I came out of Ballstall, I was still in the East End, still learning my trade at 17, you know, and um, as time was going on, I progressed from robbery with violence to going into bank robbing to Robin Armoured Wagons because of the group of people that I was associating myself with. And you were around West End, West Central London? I mean, in, in the early 60s, you were, um, what, shadowing like the, the Craze? I met the Cray Twins in the East London. That's where they were from. They were from the East End of London. The Richardsons were from West London. And um, they, were my, they were my role models. You know, because they had everything. They had the money, they had the power, they had the respect. They had the nice clothes, you know, they had all the women. You know, everyone, everyone respected them. And that's what I categorised myself with, that I was going to be like them one day. You eventually had a run-in with Rankin Dread. I mean, that's where most, a lot of people kind of got to know you. I mean, your confrontation with Rankin Dread. How did that happen? You know, before I met Rankin Dread, I'd heard about it. Ranking dread, you know, he was raping women, you know, he, he, he was bullying his own people, you know, black people, and um, he was he was known as a very violent person. And by the time I met him, I was already established on the streets with that respect. Sorry, shut the door for us, please. Yeah, with that respect. And um, someone told me about him, and I took my, my brother out on his birthday, on his 19th birthday to a club called the Four Aces at Dalston. And we was partying and someone came and told me that the guy had my brother around the throat and was gonna cut him. And when I got to him, I, I found, I realized it was Rankin Dread. And that's how I got into a confrontation with him. I, I grabbed him by his locks and pulled him back and I, I, gave, I hit him. And then I grabbed his hand where he had the knife and I held him down and eventually I got the knife from him and I was gonna stab him in the throat, but my friend told me not to. He said, let's just go. So what I done, I scalped him. I took some of his locks with me 
when I cut him. And it just turned out that it went into a, a full-scale war between Yardies and me and my friends. What was the outcome of that? We won. We won. You know, they run, and um, I got my brother into a taxi with my sisters, and then I went to my lockdown where I kept my weapons, and I took a pump-action shotgun, and we came back to Dalston, and we went looking in all the blues dances for this guy, and I thought I saw him on the street, because I saw these dreadlocks, and I told my friend to let me out of the car, and he drove past him, came back on him, and the guy ran towards me with a knife, and I had this the pump action shotgun, but I never took the safety off. And when I tried to pull the trigger, it won't happen. And eventually I've had to hit him with the butt of the gun. I smashed him on top of his head and he opened up his head like a melon. And he was knocked out. And from that, we went to all the dances because he wasn't ranking dread. It was just a dreadlocks guy. And we blew up a couple of blues dances. And from that, you know, he wasn't a problem to my circle of people. You bucked upon him in the grove as well a couple of times. You no, nothing happened. Nothing took place. It was his. It was his place to make the first move because I'd already dealt with him. I cut his locks off, and um, he's with his people. And Labrador Grove, the people in Labrador Grove know me. They know what sort of person I was, and um, he never made the move. How did you turn your life around? Just a quick summary. In 1994. In 93, sorry, on the streets of King's Cross, I'm ready to commit suicide. You know, that, that transition from a, a bank robber to a drug addict totally almost destroyed my life. In 88, comes out of prison, leaves my girlfriend who's got my daughter Justine and goes to King's Cross and I'm on the streets, you know, trying to survive with this addiction. And on the 13th of July, 1993, a man from America who was an evangelist his name was Art, he comes to me and he says, Tommy, Jesus Christ has a plan for your life and he loves you. And he tells me about the transition of his life from the life he was living as a hitman and how God changed his life. Hitman for who, where? Mexican Mafia in Los Angeles. It's, it, the Mexican Mafia are established prison organization. They run the streets from prison. And he, and he was one of their hitmen, he was an assassin. And he shared this with me and, you know, I just couldn't get my head around it, but I thought, what have I got to lose? I've tried everything and nothing's worked. So on the 13th of July, 1993, at 7.30 in our Gold Square, King's Cross, I said the prayer to become a born-again Christian. I received Jesus into my life. He took me to a, a, a place called the Lighthouse, a recovery, no medication, they said. All you need is Jesus in the morning and Jesus at night. They prayed for me. 28 years on, I have not been sick one day of my addiction. I was a 15 year heroin addict. I also had HIV that went into full blown AIDS, hepatitis. I was dying of a disease that no one had a cure for. The medical industry said there was no hope for me. They gave me six months to live. Today, from 44 to 71, they can't find a disease in my body. And now I'm a licensed minister traveling the world, ministering to broken families, drug addicts, prostitutes, to let them know there is hope in Jesus Christ.